Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Kakio, and if you're interested in DevOps, SRE, Kubernetes, and how those all fit into effective teams within an organization, then this episode is for you. Joining me today is Nana Janashia. She's a teacher, YouTuber, CNCF ambassador, Docker champion, AWS hero, all those accolades she got by helping millions of people enter the DevOps field and get really good at it. I'll put all her socials in the description below. Check her out. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Beyond coding. Do you make the, yeah. the visuals for your own channel? Do you make them this, yourselves as well? Yeah, so uh, it's two of us. So me and my friend, she does the, the post editing of the videos, yeah. uh, including the animations and thumbnail on, and all this stuff. And I, I'm the one who does, who, who says, okay, this color scheme is fine. Or yeah, like that thumbnails kind of chooses the the last one but she does actually like almost all the visuals that's really cool and you two started from the beginning because i i didn't realize that actually looking into your videos yeah so um we were both working as software engineers actually mm. in the same project uh and on the side of like freelancing on that software engineering project we were actually working on a startup mm. Um, which was like completely different thing, like in the real estate industry, like writing something for for like digital online broker kind okay. of thing for uh, rentals. And then this YouTube channel kind of be was like a super side project, like that I just started uh, because I wanted to um, have some video content on Kubernetes. Mm. Uh, because I learned a lot about Kubernetes and it was like a lot of knowledge just scattered in notes and stuff. So I, I, I basically decided to have that in a video format so I could rewatch them. So I could refresh my knowledge in the future if I needed to. And if my startup failed and nothing, uh, uh, and it was like not a success and I had to go back to freelancing <laughs> so I could refresh my <laughs> Kubernetes knowledge. That was the idea of the YouTube channel. Wow. That's, that's so simple and it's genius basically because yeah. a lot of the time like if especially if it's new and you don't use it you teach yourself something and you don't use it more on a day-to-day -day basis you're gonna have to refresh like that knowledge right because as soon as you use it day to day yeah. it's gonna be inherent it's kind of gonna be second nature and as, as soon as you stop using it you're like oh what was this thing again and you kind of need a refresher yeah. which is exactly what a youtube video would be then yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, uh, exactly. But really cool that you're doing it together with uh, uh, is it a friend? I'm assuming it's a friend yeah. or a colleague in that yeah. way. Because I've I've seen the visuals, especially like one of the latest videos. I think it was probably beginning of this year or, or late last year, where you talk about how to actually start a career in tech. Because there's various roles, there's various responsibilities. Obviously, if you're new, you're gonna have to see what you like and what you don't like. And it's a whole lot. And I saw the visualization. I saw some of the tracks that you laid out also on the website. And it looks very cool. I love the visuals. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I will also forward that compliment <laughs> to her. <laughs> Good stuff. And yeah. then do you do the trainings together with her as well? Or is that all you? No, that's so we have split that part. So we basically have no overlaps almost when we work together on these videos. Yeah. So I, uh, I have the knowledge in DevOps. So she... She, even though she has the background in software development, like she doesn't like DevOps at all. Like she would never <laughs> do that as her job actually. Yeah. And I love DevOps, right? So I actually um, uh, started like learning all this stuff and her like, the sh she doesn't have any interest in any of these DevOps technologies. So she took over like this complete post editing, mm. the animations, thumbnails, like doing the YouTube analytics and all this stuff. Uh, she helps like, um, in like researching the topic. Um, she does also a lot of social media together with me, like on our LinkedIn page and so on. Nice. Um, so all of the things around, um, but the, the research and creating the content itself, like that's all on my side, which I actually love to do um, way more than the other stuff. <laughs> so, which means it's like super great. Fit. It's amazing for me that I have actually someone who does all that part where I don't have to worry about, okay, how the video is going to be animated after that. I, I can just focus on the content itself. Yeah. Yeah. I love the synergy in that aspect. I mean, I, I know you love DevOps and it's, it's all over your channel, even with the tools and, and using the tools in a great way instead of just making stuff work. But how did you get into DevOps in the first place? Could you kind of go over that for our audience? Yeah. So, um, as I said, I started with software development and I, I actually for the first probably two years of working as a software developer, I had no idea about anything 
related to cloud or DevOps. Yeah. It was like um, I remember in the in the first project that I was working, I was actually interning in. They had like we had we were this big or the, the largest um, software development team, and then we had this tiny, teeny cloud department, which was like one guy and one intern oh, under wow. him. So that was the <laughs> that was a cloud team basically. Yeah. And we like all of us were like, oh, they're doing something with cloud, right? So that was like my um, take on cloud and my my impression. Um, so I just continued with software development. Um, uh, I tried to uh, I tried to actually do a lot of various tasks within the software development, like doing the front end, back end, different languages and stuff. Mm. So I discovered actually that I like the back end part way more. And then like um, I joined a project where we used a lot of different technologies. Like it was an actually an IoT um, project. Yeah. So we had the, the hardware components. Uh, we had the, the, the mobile application, the, the Android application for it, the web application, front and back end, um, Dockerized, so, so, so various different parts. And it was actually an amazing opportunity for me to try out different things, which I was like super curious, like, how does this work? Hardware, blah, blah, okay, not interesting. How does Docker work? Oh, that sounds interesting. And then things like Jenkins set up. So, like just by switching the between those different tasks, like the t- types of tasks, I actually realized like more and more uh, what kind of things I enjoyed doing. And there was like configuring stuff. Like I, uh, I would enjoy ta- taking like our Webpack build and optimizing it or make it faster, right? So yeah. for example, our build was like super slow and it took 10 minutes to start test or whatever. I was like, oh, I'm gonna look into it and optimize that so it takes one minute instead of 10. So I liked doing this kind of stuff. And then, and again, at this point, I have no idea of DevOps. No. Like I'm just doing like things that I, I know that are part of like software engineering, but I just love to do more than like sitting and coding. Yeah. Um, and then the, the next project was where I also joined as a software um, engineer. Mm. Um, I actually took over Kubernetes, cl- setting up Kubernetes cluster and okay. configuring all this stuff. So that's where, that was the first entry into this thing where, okay, I think I want to do this, this full time. Um, and I was actually doing full time only Kubernetes. Okay. Like the, not even like CI CD pipeline or anything. I was like full time setting up Kubernetes, configuring like hundred different things in services inside integrations. Yeah. So Kubernetes was the entry point and then the, the other DevOps technologies. I love that. I, it's very much similar to my own experience where I was in an environment where I got to try out a lot of stuff, figure out what you like and figure out what you don't like. And I think that, especially early on kind of in your career path, is so valuable because that's going to like allow you to focus on what you actually like and grow towards that and grow really fast in that. But you said kind of Kubernetes was your first experience in that, but I'm assuming you didn't have any prior knowledge to kind of being responsible for a cluster like that. Did you teach yourself things on the fly? And if so, how do you do that? Uh, yeah, so my my very first experience, Kubernetes, that was not actually the first one. Okay. Um, so, what, so what happened is that in the project that I mentioned uh, where we had everything Dockerized, uh, we didn't use Kubernetes, right? Mm. And um, again, I had this like curiosity that I wanted to um, learn like as much as possible, and also like they were more in the direction of like infrastructure uh, management and configuring configuring stuff. Um, so my idea was that I wanted to learn AWS. Yeah. Right. So um, I actually I remember I went to to uh, my manager and I said. I actually want to take um, switch from full time to like 40 hours to three, 30 hour week job because I want to take like one additional day, like uh, except for the weekend to actually learn things that I want to learn. Right. Yeah. So not something that I learn a job because we also had created this project and it was a maintenance phase. So I wasn't like learning new stuff. It was like just maintaining, fixing bugs for the customers, you know, this kind of stuff. So it was not interesting anymore for me Mm. because we weren't doing anything new. Um, So I was like, I I just need one more day in the week um, to learn things that I want to learn. And that's going to be like AWS. Um, And then my manager was like, okay, so what what exactly you want to learn? And I was like, okay, AWS, blah, 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 this setup stuff. 
And they actually offered me, they were like, uh, you know what, you can take that day and you're gonna still gonna be employed with us like 40, like full time. Mm. So we're gonna pay for that as like, you know, upskilling of our employees. Um, and I think I was actually the first one in the company who who was doing that. Yeah. So they were like, we, we anyways wanna test this out to kind of give our employees like one full day to kind of self-develop and learn whatever they want, which is gonna be like um, eventually valuable for the company. Um, so, and, and my manager was like, okay, so AWS is great, uh, but there's one more thing that I would like you to learn that our customers may need in the future, which is Kubernetes. And I was okay. like, Kubernetes, okay, yeah, whatever, why not? Um, so that was actually, so it was his input. And then I just, uh, I think over the course of like six months or so, yeah. every Friday, I would just learn AWS and Kubernetes. and. Um, I also always say that in the in the videos as well, like how to learn new stuff, right? So I didn't want to just learn some like let's go through all the AWS <laughs> services or K Kubernetes, you know. So I was like, okay, what is what is the project that I can actually take and use to learn this, right? Yeah. So I took our Dockerized application um, as an example, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna deploy that to Kubernetes cluster on AWS. So that was like a perfect project where I could just practice both skills. It was super painful and challenging <laughs> because imagine you would have like this half IoT system that is like has the integrations with these hardware components. Yeah. And you take this and while learning Kubernetes and while learning AWS. Um, and I think back then, if I remember correctly, there was no uh, Kubernetes service on AWS. Okay. So I actually configured everything from scratch. So I just rented uh, the, the servers and I had... Uh, I installed the stuff like with uh, KOps or something. So it was a little bit more difficult. Yeah. And like ev every Friday I would just work on it. And it was it was super interesting and fun doing it based on that project that I actually had. Yeah. And um I remember like at the end of 6 months or so I actually managed to um you know, to have the, the images of those containers on the, the AWS registry and then actually run them in the cluster, which was like super impressive for myself and for, for the team as well, um, because I think there was actually a plan for the customer to to ask um, ask us to actually deploy those stuff in the Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. So that was actually my first experience with Kubernetes. That is so cool. I mean, the the sense of ownership that must have had, or even even the fact that you went to your manager and said, listen, this is what I want, right? This is what I want to grow in. I'm willing to take less time and, and less pay because of that, just to teach myself those things. And obviously, props to your manager and the company for being like, no, 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 we can do this and it can be a win-win as well. The only thing you have to do is then also like look into Kubernetes because we expect this to be a bigger thing. Yeah. Good for them because they were kind of right because Kubernetes is still tried and true uh, in that kind yeah, of segment. Yeah, it was an amazing input. Like I'm so grateful yeah. now when I, when I think about it because it was like literally the the start. Like, yeah, wh why don't you just try and learn Kubernetes? Like, yeah. yeah, really, really cool. Super cool. And then obviously... Yeah. A lot of stuff now is more managed and, and more serviced towards, which makes sense. If something is established, then AWS and even the other cloud providers are going to make it more easy for you to run your stuff on there. But back then, it must yeah. have been very bare bones setting, setting everything up. And even IoT and hardware is not the, not the most easy domain to be in in that aspect, which is yeah. really cool. Did you... Yeah, so there was, there was also like the, the, the challenging part was also like super fun for me yeah. because... Um, I remember that like, mo so the, the process was that I would learn like this AWS services, I would learn Kubernetes and how it worked. And I would like um, sketch and design like how to map what we had, like these Dockerized services. Mm. Um, and each service had like different requirements, right? Like storage uh, requirement or networking requirements, like, which were different. So how do I actually put them uh, there and connect them together? So I would like, do these like solutions architect kind of kind of things and design yeah. and that was like the the fun part of it actually awesome did you get kind of guidance through that as well or were you really just thrown into the deep expecting to teach yourself a lot of things yeah it was like super like completely self-guided wow. i was just doing whatever like i would i would learn and give get input and then i would just sit down and kind of brainstorm and ideate okay how how 
do I fit these parts together? Yeah. Then I would go and research more, and then I would go back and try to put more, like more pieces together until I had like this complete picture. So it was like a, um, it, and it was it was difficult also because um, it was at a very very early stage, and there was like mm. very little information out there, like on online. I could never find like straightforward <laughs> answers to any of my <laughs> questions. Yeah. Like the troubleshooting, like something went wrong. Like I, it was just trial and error because I could never find the the appropriate answer like to that specific issue that I had online because it was just um, I would find questions where like somebody was, was like I have exactly the same question, but it was like not answered at all. So that was also a challenging part because like if you're programming, right? Like I yeah. don't know doing Java or whatever, like you would find tons of resources on it, right? Online. So that also made the the self self learning part a little bit a little bit more challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's really kind of the fact that you were more so trailblazing, right? Where everyone is kind of having the same issues, but the answer, the one final answer is not really out there yet until someone figures it out and then shares it. Yeah. That's really a stage of like an early, early on technology, I guess, and the adoption there. What I, yeah. what I wonder is because I, I started out in operations more so before I did software development. And with the tools that you use in operations, you really want resiliency, right? Because this mm -hmm. kind of piece of product or this product is going to run for a while. Um, and if it is flaky in any sort of way or if it's not as resilient, people are going to get calls or alarms and are going to be expected to like bring this thing live again when it goes down and stuff like that. And I think that's especially challenging when you're kind of adopting a technology which hasn't been established as much yet, but also when you're teaching yourself things, right? Because, I mean, from a, I can get this from a software engineering point of view. If you get stuff running, sometimes that's great, but sometimes in an operational sense, that might not be good enough, right? Because running is one yeah. thing, and then it also has to be resilient, and you have to have it configured the right way, and then even what is the right way? What, what would you mm -hmm. advise for people that are kind of figuring those things out? Is it more so, is the information now established yet? Is there more of a guideline yet in setting things up more so? Or how do you reinvent the wheel in that aspect? Yeah, that, that is a really interesting part, especially like with the with the tools that are new, right? Yeah. And especially when you do integrations of multiple tools, like the, the, like you increase the security risk because you may do like a misconfiguration in the integration part that will like expose your your um, whole cluster or whatever like application setup. Um, so that is uh, especially interesting in the in the new tool scenarios. Um, so like in my learning process and then, then how I then kind of transfer that into my YouTube videos, it was interesting because so I had this self-taught knowledge in Kubernetes, right? Yeah. And then I had um, when I joined this this project where I did like full time Kubernetes, it was like hands on, but building an actual cluster for like production, right? For a really important project in a, this huge company. Yeah. Um, so that was like a different perspective of like, I'm not just learning stuff myself and, you know, kind of test uh, creating a demo cluster. Like this is real, like this has to work in production, like with the things that you mentioned, right? Resilience and stuff. Um, so there was another perspective and um, I would, uh, there was, for me, it was important to get the input from different teams. So I would actually work right in the middle of software developers and operations engineers yeah. um, and the IT operations staff that they were actually the ones with most knowledge uh, in terms of how how the cluster, uh, especially underlying infrastructure should, wor should work. Um, so kind of the ideal case of how the cluster should be configured. And developers just wanted things like, I, I just want a database to yeah. run with these configurations so I can connect my application, right? But the IT operations guys were like, okay, so we want this kind of monitoring. We want to see, be able to see if someone, um, the, the, app, the application developers leaked any secret data and it's logged in the console. So things like that, right? So I would get input from these experienced engineers and then, okay, how do I now configure that in a Kubernetes cluster, yeah. right? So that was like my additional knowledge input for what are the best practices, like what things need to be configured generally, and now how do I configure that in Kubernetes, right? Hmm. And then additional step to that, and it was also interesting, that was like the next phase, so to say, was, okay, what are the Kubernetes best practices themselves, right? So how do I um, secure the cluster itself? Um, 
how do I, you know, make sure the the resilience is there? Yeah. Uh, using the controls that Kubernetes gives us. So it was like a f- lot of phases of, you know, like soft learning and then getting this uh, best practices of generally how the setup should look like. And then how do I map this to specific technology like Kubernetes? Um, so it's, 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 the, I don't think there's like a shortcut or easy way no. to do that because you have to like go through the stages, I think. Yeah, I, I really like that you leveraged kind of, I mean, even in learning the production experience that you had or the production experience that you were going to have in setting up that thing in production, basically, with the knowledge of both the operational side as well as the development side in what needed to be there, right, the, the actual requirements, and then looking into the best practices of how to kind of fit those requirements in the tool that you're using, which then at the time was Kubernetes. I think that's a really cool combination of kind of a factor to fit in what you were doing more daily. But since, I mean, I don't know what you do more on a day-to-day basis. This was more so the experience in the past. But now that you're educating people more and you're even training people more, do you still have that same kind of production level experience that you take with you or that same kind of level of input? Because I feel like the more you move towards trainings or even content creation, the less you move or the more you move away also from the production experience. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Um, and uh, yeah, so that happens automatically when you kind of have less time for like working on actual projects and you, you go into teaching. Yeah. So um, that would like, first of all, like I still have that curiosity that I had before uh, in terms of like the learning new stuff and okay, see where the trend is going, right? So for example, things like um, multi-cloud and um, or hybrid cloud, uh, cloud and the developments in in these directions. So what I actually did um, for a long time, like I think like the last year, almost the whole year, um, I had projects. So I would take actually consulting project, um, yeah. So consulting projects where I would work with the team that had like Kubernetes yeah. and they had like some some issues or um, usually it would be like a, a maybe software developers team who ha- had to take over the cluster management, uh, you know, take doing the, uh, creating the DevOps processes. So would take on these kind of projects where I could um, contribute, of course, like, um, you know, help them set up the Kubernetes cluster, the, the CI/CD processes, et cetera, uh, but also learn like how do different companies use that? Like what, what, are, what is their purpose and how do they try to um, implement Kubernetes to achieve those goals, right? Yeah. So I always um, try to have that accompanying uh, consulting jobs. Yeah. And especially when you do consulting and you don't like do like eight hours of troubleshooting uh, something in the cluster like yourself and you, you kind of go on a higher level, you have actually more time to look at more projects, right? Yeah. Um, so you actually have a little bit of advantage of uh, comparing like different different um, uh, you know IT projects like how does this project use Kubernetes? What environments do they have? Like what what other tools are they using? Right. So you you kind of have this. Okay, you're helping, but you're also getting input and knowledge from them. Uh, what I also did that was actually super important for me when I actually uh, started creating uh, videos on Ansible and Terraform. Okay. Uh, for example, with, with Ansible, I actually reached out to the Ansible team um, or we had a connection Then I then I kind of followed up and I was like, um, like I have these questions about Ansible and it was actually, it was the, the same thing that we talked about. So it was like, I can use Ansible and this, I know like all this stuff, but what are like the best practices of doing this? Like, am yeah. I doing this right? Is this configuration correct? Or is there like a best practice of doing that? So I um, I send them questions, and so I would actually talk to the teams mm. of uh, developers to get from them like uh, the input. I would talk to other engineers that worked at large companies to get their input. Like, how are you doing? Like, how would, how for example, there was a, um, a company that used DevOps and SRE okay. uh, in one team. So I was I was really wondering like how large companies actually divide the tasks between those two roles and like how do they manage the the combining those so i would actually just talk to engineers and get like this kind of input from um how are companies using this stuff so it is um like 
like I'm still trying to learn as much as possible yeah. and to kind of collect knowledge from multiple companies and to kind of condense that in one. Um, plus additionally, like the, I don't know, things from official documentation or whatever out there and then kind of repackage that and um, kind of put that in YouTube videos. Yeah, paying it forward in that way. Yeah. I really like that. I mean, the hard part and I think the challenging part looking from an outside point of view is like, oh, I need to know all these things or I need to like accommodate for all those things. But even the way you explained it now, you just share and collect information, right? And I think collective intelligence in that way leads to then best practices, right? And obviously best practices in combination with actual practical experience or requirements is then going to lead to the best end result. And I love that you, first of all, gather that information, leverage your network that you have or the different projects that you do consolidate that and put it in a nice package to pay it forward for those people that are kind of come behind you. I think that's really cool. But thanks. Thanks. That was a very good summary of what <laughs> you said in a very, very short form. No, no worries. That, that's my job as podcast host. <laughs> yeah. But for me, like I, uh, last year I've started teaching, teaching people more software development in specifically Go as a programming language. But what I've learned is that, first of all, I love Go, which is kind of where my love for teaching also kind of sprung, where I was like, okay, I want to teach people this. But now that I've done it once or twice and even thrice, I'm like, okay, this is kind of a, more of a routine. And it's not necessarily about the material anymore. It's more so about the interactions with the people, their perspective on things or the things that they challenge in a way. Has that also kind of been your experience? Because you've switched and you've done more with teaching rather than actual hands-on production experience. Yeah, so the, like one thing that I love about the, the part, the teaching part. Yeah. And I had this like from the very beginning, like from the very first videos that I made about Docker and especially Kubernetes um, and even now. So th that one thing is that um, like, let's say there was, there was this uh, fear around Kubernetes, right? Like mm. what are these Kubernetes components? Like they all sound the same, but they're like super difficult. So for me, the, the, the most exciting part of creating those videos was um, creating a content where someone who had read like hundreds of blog articles and maybe the whole documentation and even worked with Kubernetes um, and had like this chaos in their mind would watch the video and be like, oh, that's how it works. You know, like yeah. have the, those, those aha moments like in the, in the video and I, absolutely love that. Like when I know, okay, there, there are like lots of unanswered questions about um, some topic, like, I don't know, things like what is the difference between DevOps engineer and SRE, right? Yeah. So I would, I would actually search a lot of uh, articles, blog articles, and I would like try to notice uh, what is missing in all these articles, like what information is missing that I know that a lot of people would have, like that I have. Mm. Um, and then I would basically just uh, work on that, on delivering that information in my videos. So I kind of know that um, I'm answering the questions that they can't easily find on internet yeah. in a very specific and understandable way. And that is still what motivates me actually to, in, in every single video, I want to have those, those kind of pieces, so to say. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, that is 100% recognizable. And, and I can compare that to the episodes that I do with the podcast because... I'm in the driver's seat, right? When I'm like interviewing or talking to you, for example, I can ask the questions that would interest me, which I hope also the audience would have kind of the same questions. And for you analyzing different information that is out there with the lens of, okay, but what, what questions do I still have, right? What is still unanswered? And then finding a way to answer that for the people that tune in, I think that's, that's really cool. Like that's also obviously recognizable because that's kind of the reason why I started this podcast. And I think that helps with motivation. That's always helped me with motivation. If I do a topic which just doesn't interest me, I, I, I did a Q&A yeah. episode <laughs> and people were like, how do, you, how do you come up with new topics? I'm like, only because they're interesting do I do them, right? If they're not interesting and the most boring example I could come up with mm -hmm. was like pouring concrete, yeah, then it's not going to be a good, <laughs> it's not going to be a good yeah. episode. Like it's just not going to fly. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's very recognizable for the people that have done that. One of the questions, I mean, I had this in my head because I still kind of struggle with the concepts here and there is the thing that you mentioned. What is the difference between kind of DevOps and SRE? Because I saw those terms, DevOps first and SRE kind of later, and some people are joining them in one team and some people are keeping them very separate. 
what what are they are they separate should they be joined like how would you explain that to people that are kind of new with those terms yeah so the the brief explanation actually i uh it was one of the videos where i did the most research okay because the, the and the problem was like exactly what you mentioned like um and i think the the reason for the issue is because they're like relatively new yeah. so a lot of companies just don't know how to, to define a line between them right even like line between DevOps and development, for example, like in, in some companies, DevOps is doing the operations part, right? So like a lot, lot of, there are a lot of mix-ups there. Yeah. Uh, so when you, and when I was searching for this online, like doing the research, uh, like all the information was like very general and it was like kind of people were afraid to like specifically um, define the, the, the line between them. Yeah. So I did actually a lot of research, research including like, I watched interviews and, and content from the creators of SRE, like people who actually came up with the concept and how they actually defined that, um, plus the, the, the DevOps and then how it's actually uh, implemented in the practice, right? Because that could be a little bit different from how the original idea was. Yeah. So shortly explained, that's my view is that DevOps is actually more on the development side mm. and SRE is more on the operation side. And the reason why I think it's absolutely legitimate to have those two separate roles, even though they have overlaps and they may sound like they do the same thing, is because like when you think about DevOps, right? So you have to have development understanding. You yeah. have to understand this whole development lifecycle. You don't program as a DevOps engineer, but you have to understand how developers um, uh, work. You have to uh, work with setting up the whole CI/CD. Uh, pipeline, which is already a huge part, right? To get that completely streamlined and automated. Yeah. Then you have the infrastructure part. So if you're on cloud, like you have to be knowledgeable with AWS cloud, for example, right? Whatever cloud you're on. And then on the infrastructure part, we have the Kubernetes, which as I mentioned, it was like a full-time job, right? Just yeah. to do Kubernetes. So you have so many things as a DevOps engineer that you have to know. Then now when you go and say, you know what, you as a DevOps engineer, you also have to monitor the deployment and you have to do the operations part. Like it's just too much, right? Yeah. So I think that SRE is like a perfect uh, addition to take over some of the stuff that DevOps engineer would like possibly not be able to do and should not, like there should be some, some limit, right? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of adjacent role that kind of takes over the and focuses on the operation side. Uh, but obviously, there are lot, lots of overlaps, right? So they have the same objective, which is uh, the application should be released fast and it should run reliably. And yeah. the underlying infrastructure, cluster, everything should be reliable. And that's kind of a, a goal of both of them. Um, so they can take like their own parts, uh, but work together for the same objective. So I believe that in especially in large projects, you you should have both roles actually um maybe with multiple engineers in each role interesting i i didn't look at it through that lens that the devops side is more like adjacent towards the development side and the sre more so towards the operational side when you look at kind of an organizational structure or even a, a hierarchy in there what i've usually worked in is more so feature teams and luckily in those feature teams, I've always had the privilege that we use a lot of managed services. So the operational overhead is not as much, right? If you use a lot of like um, Cloud Run, for example, on Google Cloud Platform, you don't have to set up your own Kubernetes cluster and instances just scale as you just increase in traffic in that way, which means your operational overhead consciously is a lot lower. So we've always done then the software development side as well as the operational side, just by the virtue of operational overhead not being a lot. But I could imagine that if you take that with you and you really want to fine tune and optimize for that, especially in your use case of IoT, for example, then the operational side is going to be a whole lot more, more so than being able to fit in than that same feature team. But how would you structure then if we have, for example, a development department and an operational department? Should they should those be the same? Should the DevOps kind of knowledge and SRE knowledge fit within the same feature team? Or what have you seen that kind of works well together in that way? Um, yeah, so in the feature teams is definitely the the, the best thing is the, that you have different roles in one team. Yeah. Because like when you think about it, de developers have to work with DevOps engineer. Developers also have to work with SRE. And in, in, in fact, as like original idea is that SRE uh, should do their job 
like if they if they do their job well, they have less work. Mm. So if they automate uh, stuff in the in the you know the application setup and everything is running properly, um, reliably, and everything is automated, then you know SRE has less things to do, right? Yeah. Because everything like the monitoring is already running. If something happens, they will get notified. But what they, what do they do meanwhile? So they can take up the the developer role, right? So they can actually program. And be, become part of the development team now. Yeah. Um, so I think, and because you have these kind of combinations, right? So um, I don't know. Test engineers have to work with DevOps engineers because they they are a really important part of the whole CI/CD pipeline part, right? You have security engineers, for example, they should you know provide inputs and make sure the cluster is running properly. It's secured on multiple levels. The infrastructure um, is secured. Uh, you have the security checks in the pipeline, right? So like when you think about these uh, roles, the tasks of these roles, everything is kind of intertwined, right? Yeah. So it makes complete sense to have these people working together instead of having like department of just SRE and department of just these people, because then you would ha still have that overhead of mixing up people and have you know having them communicate with each other. Yeah. But I think it's just easier when it's project based, like feature teams. Um, where like everybody, everyone has the knowledge of what the other people are doing in the same project. Yeah, yeah, I think so as well. I think the the best teams are with, with a shared mental model, right? And if your team needs to just put out a lot of software, it needs to land in production, needs to be resilient, and obviously you need to see what ha what's happening over there, then you need all those aspects in that same team. Otherwise, you can't do it. Right? Otherwise, you would be glued to another team who picks up kind of those operational responsibilities and that, that doesn't make sense because then as one team, you're going to be misaligned with another team and you can't really do something else without that other team. So then are you really autonomous in that way? Not really. So I really like mm -hmm. that you also mentioned that the knowledge for whatever you're doing should be within the team, right? In isolation yeah. to make sure that you are autonomous in that way. I also, and this is more so my personal pre experience, have heard from people that are more labeled as cloud engineers or platform engineers or what have you can pick any label in that aspect that they like that experience more being within the feature team seeing kind of what what goes on there instead of being kind of taken out of that context and putting like being put in more of a platform specific team but then on the flip side also online i've seen that that also works where you have platform engineering teams for example whose goal is to make a platform which kind of functions as a product for other developers then for to make their work better in that way so I don't yeah, know if there's a I, I see, move. I see um, like I can imagine the, the separation working for platform engineers or cloud engineers specifically yeah. because um, like there's a little bit more separation there, right? So they, they do their job, like manage and create this uh, reliable cloud infrastructure. Yeah. Maybe they do like some migrations. Some like a lot of the tasks could be that is not directly related to the application itself or the project. Um, and could be like for the whole company, right? Where lots of applications can can actually use the same cloud environment. So that, that I would say this, this is like one of the roles that I can imagine can be like its own department. Yeah. But at some point, like like when when there is a overlap of okay, so you know, cloud engineer has to configure and manage the Kubernetes cluster, for example, on AWS. Um, they still have to work with. Uh, software developers and like specific project teams. So again, there's like a lot of advantages of having them in the feature team as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, even even I'm now also in an IoT project, so I like that you mentioned that. But the the way we solve problems, right? We can do that in different avenues. And if you don't have the the respective knowledge of the different domains within the same team, then you're gonna always solve it in the way that is within your domain. Like if I'm a software engineer, I'm gonna do stuff that is programmatically more accurate or to get stuff done. Yeah. Whereas if I have a cloud engineer next to me, he can challenge me and be like, oh, maybe we should put that in Terraform, right? And both are going to have pros and cons and it's really going to depend on our use case. But if that conversation doesn't take place, even if those teams are separate, then everyone's kind of doing their own thing and you don't really have standardization, you don't have that knowledge, you don't have cross-pollination yeah. with regards to knowledge sharing in that way. So yeah, a lot yeah, of stuff that's then a, happens. That's a really interesting, yeah, that's a really interesting point actually, yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, but, yeah. that's more of a personal learning that I've seen. But also, I don't know if you if you saw any of this. When I Googled DevOps, and especially lately, I've been a bit more on Twitter, 
I saw a lot of t- a lot of terms uh, related to platform engineering saying that DevOps is dead, or a lot of YouTube videos <laughs> being obviously jumping on that and being like, "Ooh, is DevOps dead?" What what is kind of your take on that? Because I do think more and more companies are trending towards platform engineering to kind of reduce their operational overhead. But then, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think. I, I mean, I think that. The, if this trend uh, continues, which is going to be good, I think DevOps engineers will not be like DevOps engineer will not be dead, but the yeah. DevOps engineers maybe can breathe a little bit more <laughs> because the uh, like a part of their responsibility can be like uh, distributed and taken over by another role. Yeah, but they still would have like a large um, set of tasks that still like would have to do. So I think it would just be like okay they have their less workload, right? So they can actually <laughs> concentrate like on smaller set of tasks and, and kind of do that. So like generally, I don't think DevOps is going anywhere um, for the next years uh, because like, and that's again, based on the input that I uh, have, you know, seeing all the companies and, and uh, hearing about the project is that a lot of companies are still very, far away from like having this super nice streamlined process, automated process. Yeah. A lot of things are still being done manually and that's exactly like where DevOps brings the most value. So I think um, like when you think about the benefits of having these automated processes, I think uh, companies would still want to do that. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the things that DevOps engineer is doing specifically is not part of platform engineer or cloud engineer's job. So. I, that that's the reason why I think DevOps is actually gonna, um, you know, either stay demanded as as now or even even become more demanded. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that as well. And even even let's say we we're in a world where a lot of stuff has been automated, then that will probably bring new challenges, and the DevOps role will kind of morph into solving those challenges. Then, right? Just because yeah. something morphs yeah. doesn't mean you don't morph with it. That's kind of the whole thing yeah. in this tech landscape, which I enjoy as well. No, uh, I've um, one of my final questions was I did a lot of research on you and I saw you're a CNCF ambassador. Uh, I think it's AWS champion or hero and Docker champion or hero. But were those always like are those goals that you set for yourself and then you achieve, or are those more byproducts because of the things that you're already doing? Yeah, so they were a hundred percent byproducts. Because yeah, right. It was okay. This will be actually funny, but I actually didn't know any of these <laughs> titles existed. So I remember, uh, I remember seeing uh, content of one of the Docker captains. So that's the title. Mm. And I was like, "Wow, such a clever name!" I actually <laughs> thought that that is also a content creator. I was like, "Wow, that's a cool name!" Yeah. And I actually thought it was like the the made up name of the content creator. So when when Docker reached out, actually, uh, Docker was the first one to reach out. And they were like, yeah, we would like you to be a Docker captain. I was like, oh, that's a title that you know you, you can get for <laughs> producing content on the technology. So uh, I was obviously like super honored and flattered because like I had been using Docker for a long time. Uh, and then AWS reached out and then CNCF. Mm. And so it was completely like byproduct. Uh, it, even if I had known about them, I think it still wouldn't have been my goal. Yeah. Um, because the same way, like, for example, sure, like I would, would have wanted to have like hundred thousand subscribers, you know, 500,000 subscribers, but even the subscriber act, uh, count was not like my goal. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was more like my goal is like, as I, as I said, right. For every single video that I produce or produce, uh, I wanted it to be the most unique, right? So the information that you get here. Uh, like at least like 20% of the information you cannot get anywhere else because it's like condensed, like, I don't know, processed. So that was my goal. And the, the, and then I would just check like analytics once in a week or once in a month yeah. to just see the, the growth, right? So we still have the growth. And then at some point we're going to reach half a million subscribers. At some point we're going to reach uh, 1 million subscribers. So those things like are usually not my goals. Like things that are like more measurable are not my goals usually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's honestly, that's what I was hoping for. Just based on how this conversation flowed, I feel like you have 
such a drive that that would never be towards a statistic or something that's measurable, but more so about like a curiosity or kind of an insatiable thing to be really good at something. And then obviously the way you pay it forward has a lot of byproducts that come out of that. So I'm really happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it also takes a lot of pressure off you right? Uh, yeah. as, a, as a creator because when, when you decide, you know what, I'm just going to focus on my efforts and I'm going to try to produce the best um, video. Like this is, I want this video to be the best on Prometheus or best on whatever. Um, it just takes off. You, I really don't care about the views. Like if I, if I know that the video, um, I think I, we had this video about... Um, hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, right? Okay. I thought the topic was interesting yeah. and I did some, some research and um, like I knew like most of the stuff of, about this, but um, you know, I, I tried to also produce content that was like unique and I think it didn't get many views or, or, or something. Like it was like one of the least viewed. Mm. Like I, I didn't care. Like for me, it was like, I created the video that I really like and I'm like super, you know, proud of and I enjoyed the creation process. So I really didn't care that it didn't perform like super well, you know? Yeah. So those measures, it just takes off the pressure yeah. when you're creating because you don't care. Like Exactly. That's, yeah. that's probably way more healthy than to be depressed <laughs> about like statistics and numbers and stuff like that. Yeah. As a, as a final thought I still had, and it's, it's probably because I saw that last video when people are newly coming into the tech domain as a whole kind of early in career in that way as well, they're going to try out a lot of things to see what works out for them. But exactly as you mentioned, the reason why DevOps is there, the reason why SRE got there in the first place as well, is because right now we're in a landscape where things are quite complex. There's different roles and specializations for a lot of things just so they fit together as puzzle pieces and the whole puzzle should then be in a team as well. But if you're really early on in your career, what would kind of be your advice in figuring out what you kind of are going to do at the end of the day role-wise or, or even what's a good fit in there? Um. I mean, I've, I've actually, usually I would say it's a software development yeah, um, and full stack because I think you can start like with basic full stack, like trying everything out, like front and back end, not, not necessarily just one, mm. and then kind of test it out there. Uh, but there are also a lot of, um, like apart from software engineering directly, like a lot of IT roles that you can also use as an entry point, right? Yeah. So I think... Um, like everybody has at some level, I believe, um, kind of a direction, like inclination towards a specific area. For example, um, I met a lot of people who said, you know, I like data, right? So how can I get started in IT um, with, with this direction, right? So in, in the data science direction. Yeah. So in that, in that area, they're like as a data analyst, for example, but as an entry level. Um, so... I think if, if the person doesn't know, like, okay, they want to do like data or they are fascinated by AI and eventually they want to work there. I think the best thing to start is still software development, mm. uh, software engineering. Um, and as I said, like, uh, I think I mentioned that like several times in the video because I, I know that a lot of people are stressing out like, okay, but I, if, I, if I learn this and then later I want to do something else in the IT, like, you know, it's a wasted time. But that's the thing, like, if you, if you learn uh, software development, like, you can, there are so many other IT roles where you can reuse that knowledge, right? Yeah. Uh, even, like, in machine learning or, or data science, you can use your software engineering skills, right, uh, and knowledge. So I think um, I would just start with, with whatever is the easiest to start with, with, which again, in my opinion, is software development, yeah. um, because also because of the resources, uh, the amount of resources available. I think the software development has the most uh, because it's not like the newer uh, profession as like data related yeah. data engineering stuff. So you will find like lots of free tutorials, lots of you know uh, courses out there, even boot camps, whatever. Um, and then like once you're like inside the IT field, like if you get the job, like you have so many opportunities, like you can switch jobs and you can do one year of completely different thing and another one, uh, completely something else. Um, and I think that's like a lot, a lot of people I see enjoy that dynamic and change, yeah. right. Switching between roles. Like I would like 
there are like lots of stuff that uh, I did in the software development, like especially front-end development that I don't use now anymore in the DevOps, but it's not like I wasted my time. Like it's still, it was still good invested time, right? Yeah, it's uh, experience. To learn those skills. So um, yeah, like entry level, and then you can even as a, even as a little bit more experienced engineer, you can just switch around and do something else, right? So switch roles, um, come back to the original role after discovering that you didn't like any other roles out there. So I think the opportunities are really unlimited in IT. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. The The interesting thing is, because I also thought about this, a lot of things probably originated from software development, right? If you look at what a data engineer does, they incorporate data and software and put it into production. Well, the software development component is still out there. And I had a, yeah. I had a conversation with a security specialist and they said, they, are, they were actually following one of my Go trainings and they were like, okay, I think I'll be a better security specialist if I have a better view of what actually the developer experience is or what developers face on a more day-to-day -day thing so I can better accommodate for that, right, with the conversation I have, with the communication, with the security perspective that he has. And I thought that was a very interesting perspective, right, because a lot of things actually do come together. So exactly as you say, if you take with you a bunch of experiences from different domains, they're not a wasted experience, right? Because they're going to give you yeah. a perspective that other people probably within that same role and field might not have, which is then going to help you challenge conversations and challenge thought for the end result to be better because of that. And I think the landscape that we have now, yes, it is complex, but that also brings out a lot of opportunities, right? For people that are like eager as yourself to learn a lot about specific domains and to really figure out where their drive is. And eventually you will probably land it. Time is going to vary. And yes, you might not... Mm -hmm. think that experience is relevant, but you're going to take it with you and that is then your career path. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, I really Absolutely. enjoyed this conversation, Nana, coming from your really like, your drive really shines through in this conversation, which I really enjoyed talking about, as well as your journey and training and, and educating people as well. Is there anything you'd still like to share with our audience before we leave off? Um, no, I think the the something that I always mention is and I, I also see that this is something that we share. I think the unique thing that uh, people take with them when they enter the IT um, um, IT role and kind of uh, develop and advance is this curiosity and like excitement of learning new things. And I think also what's unique about IT is you never lose that because it never gets like boring and, and, the, and the same. It's like super dynamic. So I think that's like the most exciting part of this whole thing um, yeah. that I also see in, in so many engineers. Like I don't, I don't actually remember any exceptions from this. Yeah, yeah, I 100% align with that. We're going to round it off here, everyone. Thank you for listening. I'm going to put all Nana's socials in the description below. Nana Janesha, check her out. And with that being said, thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next one.